When talking about databases, people will always mention the same usual suspects, which enjoy huge community adoption and are backed by massive corporations. But during this time, a small little library is quietly powering the world. Your phone, your browser, your smartwatch, your car's infotainment system, and even parts of your operating system are proudly relying on SQLite. And yet, most developers barely think about it. And, trust me, if you are dismissing it, you are missing out. Sure, SQLite is simply a C library working with files on the disk, but, despite its apparent simplicity, it has outlived almost every tech trend of the past two decades. The database was created back in the year 2000, and it was initially written by a software engineer named D. Richard Heap. He was working for the US Navy at the time, and his goal was to create a lightweight, serverless database engine for missile control systems. The Navy's constraint was that the system needed to operate without relying on a full-fledged database server, as such systems could be impractical in the confined, resource-limited environment of a ship or submarine. So SQLite was designed to be embedded directly into applications, requiring no separate server process, which made it ideal for such use cases. So, interestingly, it turns out that the software that enables combat systems on Navy ships is also a good fit for keeping your smartphone's dating app running smoothly. And the result is one of the most elegant pieces of engineering in software history. SQLite is serverless, self-contained, zero configuration and transactional. And despite this apparent simplicity, it still is fully ACID compliant. It supports transactions, constraints, indexes, triggers, views, and everything you'd expect from a serious database system. And its internal architecture is even more interesting. SQLite stores an entire database ranging from tables, indexes, or triggers in a single portable binary file on disk. This file is platform independent, so you can copy it across different operating systems, email it, zip it, or check it into Git. The file format is also backward compatible, so a database created by an older version of SQLite can still be read by newer versions. This design is a key reason for SQLite's portability and ease of use. On top of that, when you make changes, it uses a write-ahead log system to ensure atomicity and durability, so if your app crashes mid-write, your database won't get corrupted. In practice, when you make a change like an insert or an update, SQLite records the transaction in the wall file first. Once the transaction is committed, the changes are eventually checkpointed to the main database file. If a crash occurs mid-write, data can be recovered by replaying the wall file, ensuring no operations are lost or corrupted. On top of that, this approach allows for better concurrency, as readers can access the database while writes are happening. This is a subtle but brilliant aspect of the design. Instead of running as a multi-user server, the access is coordinated at the file system level using byte range locks. The performance is also impressive. Because the database runs in process, there is no socket or network communication needed. So, since there is no communication latency, SQLite is often faster than client-server databases for small to medium workloads. The only time it struggles is when multiple processes try to write at once, since it uses file locks rather than concurrent writers. But, for a big chunk of real-world applications, that's not a problem. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that companies like Apple, Google, Adobe and Microsoft all use SQLite internally. Chrome uses it for your browsing history. Firefox uses it for bookmarks. And WhatsApp, iMessage, Android or iOS are all relying on SQLite to store user data. Even Tesla's in-car software uses it for telemetry and logs. So calling SQLite lightweight is kind of misleading. Sure, it is lightweight in size and resource usage, but it is definitely heavyweight in reliability. The funny thing is that the test suite for SQLite has over 500 times more code than the database engine itself. This is, of course, a must since SQLite is used in safety-critical systems like aircraft, medical devices, or military applications where bugs could have catastrophic consequences. Developers often assume that SQLite is just for prototypes or not suitable for production. They couldn't be more wrong. SQLite is actually the most widely deployed database software in existence and its only limitation is concurrency, so if you're building a massive multi-user web app with thousands of writes per second, it might not be ideal. But for single-user apps, embedded systems, desktop tools, or edge computing, it's perfect. Before looking at some practical examples, please let me tell you a few words about today's sponsor. Zavala is an all-in-one, no-friction platform as a service for deploying anything ranging from interactive apps to databases or static sites, offering cloud-native performance and a seamless dev experience with advanced deployment pipelines, instant preview for apps or static websites, and one-click deploy templates to accelerate your development process. 
Under the hood, Sevala is leveraging Google Kubernetes engine across 25 regions, and thanks to Cloudflare's Edge network integration, your static content is globally optimized for speed. Check out the link in the description and you can get started for free with a $50 credit, no hidden fees and predictable payments. Back to our video, SQLite isn't run like a corporate product, so it has no CEO, no marketing team, and no cloud-based service or subscription model. It's a lean project maintained by HIP and a few core contributors. It is funded through consulting, support contracts, and donations rather than a commercial product strategy. Since it is released under the public domain, other companies like Terso got the chance to fork it and build on top of all this power. If you are not familiar with it, Terso builds on top of SQLite's foundation and turns it into a distributed, edge-ready database. Instead of relying on a centralized server, Terso replicates your SQLite databases across multiple locations close to your users. So you still get the same SQLite reliability, dev experience and file format, but now it's backed by a network that synchronizes changes globally with low latency. Now, using SQLite is as easy as you would expect. We'll start by running this command which does two things. First, it'll create an AppDB file on the disk and it opens the CLI. Then, we'll add in some pragma statements to enable foreign keys and add the wall mode to ensure our transactions are atomic and durable. We'll also set synchronization to normal, which means SQL will sync data at critical moments, balancing durability and performance. We could also set this value as full to make sure all data and journal changes are fully written to disk before continuing, maximizing durability but slowing performance, or we could disable syncing to make writes faster but risk losing data if the system crashes or loses power. We can then create a new table, define a primary key, default values and field types. Note that SQLite supports a very flexible and forgiving type system. Unlike databases such as Postgres or MySQL, it doesn't enforce rigid column types. Instead, it uses a concept called type affinity, where every column has a preferred storage class, but SQLite will still store any type of data in any column. At the high level, however, SQLite recognizes five primary storage classes. With the structure in place, we can now perform all the CRUD operations you are familiar with. We can insert one or multiple values at once, read the data using various where clauses, ordering or pagination, update or delete the data. But this is just one table and SQLite does a great job when it comes to joins and aggregating data as well. For instance, we could join multiple related tables and calculate aggregated values directly in a single query. In this example, we start from the orders table, alias Tazo, where each row represents a single purchase made by a user. Using join, we then connect every order to its corresponding user, allowing us to display the user's email next to their order. Then, we join order items linking each order with its individual items, since one order can contain multiple products. The sum expression multiplies quantity by price for each item and adds them up to get the total cost of the order. Finally, the group by clause ensures that this sum is calculated per order rather than across all order items, while order by source the results by order ID for readability. The result of such a query would probably look something like this. And, as I mentioned earlier, transactions are also supported, so we can obtain a lock, perform our updates, and then commit the changes, all in one big operation. And, of course, we can easily take one step further and integrate these operations into any project we are working on. For instance, in Golang, we can interact with SQLite using the standard SQL package together with the GoSQLite 3 driver. In the code, we can open a connection to our DB file and pass in the configuration details we need. From here, creating tables or inserting data is just standard SQL. So you get the point. SQLite is versatile, reliable, and easy to use to the extent where it is not only used as a database engine, but as a data format. Instead of exporting to CSV or JSON, some developers ship entire SQLite databases as configuration bundles, read-only datasets or caches. The file format is cross-platform, Endian independent, and future-proof. So a database created on a 2005 PowerPC Mac will still open on a 2025 ARM device without conversion. So next time you hear about SQLite, think twice before dismissing it. If you like this video, you should check out one of these ones next. Please don't forget to click on all the buttons YouTube is throwing at you these days, and until next time, thank you for watching.